This morning, I want to talk about the topic, and I, I think that second song that we talked about, that we sang today, it said, you know, I know a breakthrough is coming. I can feel a miracle. Amen. Come on, we've got the God of breakthrough. Amen. We've got the God of miracles. We've got the God who moves. We've got the God who changes lives. Amen. We, we can take that for granted so much, but we've got a God that is powerful today. And the topic I want to share on is something I've, I've touched on before, but I want to open up just from a different passage of Scripture, and it's this. Sometimes we have to go through to get to. Sometimes we've got to go through in order to get through or get to where God would have us. But in that going through, there becomes a breakthrough so that you get to where God would have you to be. Amen? You know, Psalms 23, I haven't got this up there, but... It's, David said this, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, I look at that and I think a rod and a staff, you would normally think that is for punishment, but that's not what it's for. He said it brings comfort to me. You know why? Because when he's going through that dark walk on that tough time, he's got the hand of God that's just tapping him every now and going, hey, head down this way. Go in that direction. There's this guidance. There's this direction that's there. And that brings great comfort to us. You know, in the times where we're going through difficult times, the great thing today is that we know as Christian people, we don't have to go through that battle on our own. That when you walk through the valley, there's somebody walking right beside you through that valley time, through that tough time that you don't have to do it on your own. When people run away from God in the tough times, that's the craziest thing to do because you're running away from the only person that can take you through and out the other side. David said, I will fear no evil for you are right with me. Hallelujah. It just brings a comfort to me. This morning, I want to talk about a great man of God who didn't start off as a great man of God and his name was Saul or Paul as the Bible uses the terminology a lot of the time. And as we know, in the life of Saul, and it talks about him in the book of Acts, um, he was a man that started off with a hatred towards Christian people. He was like the Christian terrorist. He was the guy that would terrorize Christian people. And he would persecute them. He would hunt them down. He would look for them and try and to have them put into prison and have them locked up, to have them punished. He didn't like Christians. He was a Jew of the Jews, he said, a Pharisee of the Pharisee, and he was proud of it. He was controlled by the law and lived according to the law. So when he seen Christians out there and they were teaching something new about the Messiah, the Jews didn't believe the Messiah had come, so he was out there trying to destroy Christians, and many times he did horrific things. He was there when they, st when they stoned Stephen to death. Paul was standing right there. He held their garments as they stoned this saint to death, the first martyr in the Bible, in the New Testament scriptures. And they stoned him to death, and Paul was standing right there watching it go on. But we know that something happened to Paul on the road of Damascus. When he was heading off with, the, he had his own agenda in life. How come, how many of us here have sometimes got our own agendas and what we did in life? Especially before we were Christians. We had it all planned. This is what I'm doing. This is what I believe. This is, you know, that's what I'm standing on. These are my, thoughts. but all of a sudden something happened to Paul. Acts 9, 1 to 6 says this. Meanwhile, Saul, or Paul, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to, to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, that's Christianity, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. What an amazing thing. 
Don't you like those suddenlies in God? The suddenlies in the Bible. Where God can take somebody like Paul that's got an agenda that's so anti-God and in an instant totally turn his life around and he's going in the different direction. Come on, don't, don't ever think that the people you know around the place are too hard for God to get a hold of and change their life. They couldn't get anybody tougher than this, than this bloke. He was looking for letters so he could go to synagogues, find Christians and put them into prison. And yet he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, it was, that day. And it was, he was so baffled by it, he asked a question and he answered. He goes, who are you, Lord? Get that? He answered his own question. He knew who it was when he had an encounter. You will never forget when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ. It will change your life forever. Amen? Anybody remember when you first encountered Jesus Christ? You can never forget that, amen? It doesn't matter whether it was in the gutter or it was in a palace or where it was. When you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you are never, ever the same again. He said to him, I will tell you what you need to do. See, Paul was full of pride, but who knows? Pride comes before a fall. True. Paul literally was knocked off his horse off his high horse. That's what happened. Paul was knocked off his horse. He hit the ground. The scripture says that he was blind for three days. Couldn't see anything. For that three days, he didn't eat or anything like that. It must have been a shock because he'd be going, what's happened here? Is this punishment from God? Am I going to be blind forever? Because God didn't say you're going to be blind for three days. He was just blind. He led him. He had to be led by the hand to a place, Judas's place that was on Straight Street. God had told him exactly where he needed to go. And then God told Saul that there would be a man by the name of Ananias that would come and would pray for him. And when God spoke to Ananias and he said, I want you to go and pray for Paul, Ananias said, I'm not going there anywhere near that bloke. I've heard the stories about him. He was a Christian. It had been like an American going to talk to Osama bin Laden or somebody like that. It's a, he was a terrorist amongst those people. And yet, God said, I want you to go and talk to Paul. I want you to go and lay hands on him. I want you to pray for him. You know, sometimes we've got to lay aside the things we hear about people and just see their heart, see what God's doing in them. Amen. He went there and he prayed. And Acts 23, 11 says, The following night, the Lord stood near Paul. Hang on, I'll go back one. Acts 9, 15 to 16. We just go back one scripture. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he have to, will have to suffer for my name. You know what's interesting here is, here's the Jew of the Jews. Anybody ever said, God, I will never do that. I don't care what you ask me to do, but I won't do that. Who knows, you end up a lot of the time doing that. I remember saying, I'm never going out to Halls Creek. That's the last place. People would say to me, you'll end up out there working out that way. I'm going, I don't want to go out there. Guess where you end up? The last place Paul ever thought he'd be ministering to was the Gentiles. He didn't even like Gentiles. But it's amazing what God can do when he gets a hold of your, of your life. How he can turn things around. He can just grab a hold of somebody's heart. And something that he had a hatred for before, now he's got a love and a passion for that. Amen? Come on. Ananias prayed for him and something like scales fell from his eyes. Paul had no idea of the Gentiles that God would bring him into contact with. But he said, I will bring you before the Gentiles and even their kings. That's amazing, isn't it? That he's going to get an opportunity to share the gospel even with kings in the Gentile areas and the people of Israel. When he got saved and 
He started going on for God. He tried to do ministry, but people were still so afraid of Paul because of the threats that he'd made before. So Paul went away into the wilderness for a period of time. And after a period of time, then he came back and he started to preach the gospel. And when the Jews in Jerusalem found out that he was preaching the gospel and no longer the law, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. They actually said, we won't eat or drink another thing until we kill Paul. That's pretty sincere, isn't it? It's like having a hit on him. We're not going to eat another thing until that fellow is dead because we don't like what he's doing. They were out to get him. They were out to destroy what God was putting upon his life to do. In Acts 23, 11, it says, The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have to testify about me in Jerusalem, and so you must also testify in Rome. Wow. It was one thing to be preaching in Jerusalem. That was even dangerous, very dangerous for Paul because he converted to Christianity, become a Christian. But to go to Rome, that was the superpower of the day. That was a Roman Empire. And if you've ever been to Italy and been to Rome, it is an amazing city. There's so much of the old city that's still left there. Some of it's crumbling down. But when you walk through that place, you go, it is just incredible. The buildings that they built, and you can see that it was a superpower in its day. But God said to him, you're going to be ministering in Jerusalem, but you're also going to testify about me in Rome, at the capital the superpower of the world at that time. Paul was taken to Caesarea on the way and he had a chance to share the gospel with the governor there, governor, and his name was Felix. And while Paul was sharing with Felix, Felix got so convicted that he sent him away. He said, hey, just go away from me. He also got a chance to share with King Agrippa, the king at the time in that area. In Caesarea, I like what, I, what he says here. Acts 26, 25 to 29, it says this. He was having a shot at Paul. Paul said, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. It's a good name. Paul replied, what I'm saying to you is true and reasonable. The king, Agrippa, is familiar with these things and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, what Jesus had been doing, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, he just straight at him, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think in, that in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian? This is Paul's response. Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today will become what I am except for these chains. He's saying, you know what? I don't care if it takes five minutes or five years. I just want you to become what I am today, a born-again, spirit-filled Christian that loves God. Amen. Come on. Except for these chains. He was bound up at that time. King Agrippa then sent, him, sent Paul to Rome to stand before Caesar. They put him on a boat in a place called Sidon. He boarded a ship and, and he was going to Rome in Italy. Finally, after that time, Paul was going to where the Lord had called him to go. Paul was on his way to Rome. He was heading in the right direction. He was fulfilling what God had asked him to do. And in Acts 27, 13, it talks about a great storm of hurricane force. So there's a hurricane that came up and it started to knock the boat around. It started to um, just beat the boat. It was rocking backwards and forwards. It was smashing the waves. It got so bad that they got ropes and tied them around the hull of the ship to try and hold the ship together. Imagine trying to do that on a rough sea. How do you get ropes underneath the boat in order to tie it all together? It was that bad. And these were professional sailors. These were guys that were merchant seamen that used to go from place to place and take goods. And here they were panicking and that they were scared that it was going to break apart. So they threw all their cargo overboard. It says that they couldn't even see the moon and the stars for many, many days. The storm was that great, they couldn't even see the sky. And back in those days, they needed the stars to navigate. 
So without the stars and they're in this storm, they had no idea where they were going. They had no idea where they were going to end up. They had no idea where this boat was going to. All they knew was this boat was starting to break apart and they were in the midst of this storm. Paul speaks in Acts 27, 21. After the men had gone a long time without food, probably a bit seasick, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail to Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. I don't know if that's consolation or not. Out in the open sea. You know what? I like Paul because he just speaks the word of God in faith. See, those guys weren't believers and he stood before them all and he said, not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. He said, last night an angel of God, whose I am or who I belong to and who I serve, stood before me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. It's an amazing story, isn't it? I mean, here he is in the, racked in the middle of a storm. These professional fishermen. Paul wasn't a fisherman. Peter was, but Paul was, and he's on this boat. They're trying to hold this ship together. It's breaking apart. But you know what? Paul stands on the word of the Lord that he was given. First point I want to make today is don't doubt your deliverer. Don't doubt your deliverer. Amen? God had said to Paul, you're going to get to Rome. Paul trusted God, and he said, hey, I've got a word from God, we're going to get to Rome, but also I've got a word from God that even though this ship will break up, not one life will be lost. So have something to eat and take some courage in this. You know what, when we get a word from God, it allows us not only to encourage ourselves, but it can be a word that encourages others as well around us. Amen? These followers were fearful. This ship was breaking up. They didn't know where they were going to end up. They had no idea that they were lost. But Paul, who wasn't a fisherman, didn't know anything about sailing. He didn't know much about cargo, but he did know his God. And he had a word of encouragement for the guys. And he said, not one will be lost. You know what? When you stand on the word of God and what he gives you, God is faithful to fulfill it. Amen? You might be in the midst of the storm, but I want to tell you, God is still faithful to fulfill his word. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if you've lost your way a bit. These guys couldn't see the stars. They had no idea where they were heading. They didn't know. They'd they'd lost their direction. They seemed like they were in no man's land at this point and thinking, what's God doing in all this? But still, trust the word of the Lord. For when you stand on God's word, God moves to fulfill it. Miracles happen when we live by faith. Amen? Faith is a currency of heaven. Those that live by faith will see the miraculous. Paul spoke it out to these people on this ship, what God had told him. 39 says, when daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach. When they decided to run the ship aground, if they could, cutting loose the anchors, there was no going back, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. So now they're just making a crack at it, did as quick, as, as close as they can to shore before it all falls apart. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away. 
and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everybody reached the land safely. What an amazing story that they made it onto this island and not one of them had perished. Point number two, God uses the driftwood. God uses the driftwood. The very thing that they thought was going to destroy him was the very thing that saved them. The breaking up of the ship was the thing that they thought when they were going to die because the ship was breaking up. That was the thing that was going to destroy them. But that breaking up was actually the thing that saved them because they clung on to the pieces and those pieces brought them to the shore. I want to say that God can even use the brokenness in your life in order to get you to where he'd have you to be. Come on, the Bible says God works all things together for good for those that are called according to his purposes. Aren't you glad of that? Come on. That in that, those broken things that were there, they clung on to those broken things and those things, those pieces of planks or those pieces of wood, that driftwood was the things they held on to and it brought them to the land and they got there safely. I want to say God doesn't bring the brokenness, but he uses the brokenness. The thing you think when you're going through the midst of it, you think it's going to destroy you, but God will turn it around and he'll use it for, your, for his glory and to get you to the place where you can fulfill what he's called you to do. God is able to use the brokenness of our lives to enable us to get to where he would have us to be. He also uses the brokenness to be hope to those around about us as well. See, that didn't just save him, but it saved the others that were there as well. The amazing thing was a lot of sailors back in that time couldn't swim. Crazy, isn't it? And the fact that they never learned to swim and yet they're on ships their whole life, fall overboard, what do you happen? They clung on to those broken pieces. It said that they'd actually given up all hope of being saved. You know what? Can you imagine when they got to the shore and they looked around and they started counting everybody and they realized that the word Paul had had come to pass. Very rare did a ship sink in those days and there were survivors. Think of that in the Abrolis Islands and different things like that. How many people perish when a ship goes down and yet there's islands right close there very rarely do any people back in those days make it but not one soul was lost that day because Paul had a word from God isn't that encouraging amen God can use the driftwood in our lives that's that scripture Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Hallelujah. God uses that driftwood. He uses the broken things in your life and it will be something that he will use for his glory. You know why? That's why they use people that have gone through the program and they put them back in as leaders at Teen Challenge. You know why? Because they've been through the valley. They know what it's like. And so now they run the program. And when people say, you've got no idea what it's like to be where I am, they go, well, as a matter of fact, this was me. And they go, wow, if God can do that in you, imagine what he can do in me. So when God uses that brokenness in our lives, not only does it bless us, but it can be a great blessing in the future to many others that God places around about us that have gone through exactly the same thing. Who knows? You can't really understand grief until you've been through grief. 
You can't understand loss until you've been through loss. You don't understand what it's like to be in, in addictions and things like that until you've been through it. I'm not saying that you need to go through it in order to help people. You can still do that. But God will use that which you've gone through in your life and he will turn it around and use it for his glory and to build his kingdom. Amen? The third thing, put down the plank. God can use the driftwood, but you know what? There comes a time when you've got to put down the plank. I, I remember a mate of mine, my dad's mate, was building a prawn trawler in his front yard. He built his own house. It was triangular, and every room in it was triangular. Try and get furniture for that. He realized after building the house, not a good idea. He had to make all the furniture for the house as well. You'd walk in there and you get totally disorientated. He was an unusual guy. But I seen him building this, this big, about 60-foot boat, prawn trawler. And he had these planks that are about this thick and about that high. And he was bending them and shaping them around the hull of this boat. And it went right around and right. And I'm looking at it thinking, how do you even bend pieces of wood that are that thick? And he completely finished this prawn trawler in his front yard. The next problem was, how do you get it to the water? They had to cut power lines. They had to do all that. But, you know, I think about that and I think about the size of those planks that they would have clung to in order to get to the shore. The things that saved them, that got them to the shore, the broken pieces that were there. You can't carry around those things for the rest of your life. They become a burden to you. There comes a time that that one thing you've gone through, that brokenness, you've just got to put it down. Otherwise, you'll never get to where you're going to, God wants you to go. Could you imagine Paul turned up to Rome and he's got this massive plunk of wood under his arm and he's just walking into the place there in front of Caesar. And, What's that? And he said, oh, this is what saved me. This is a plank of wood here. What are you carrying that around for? I don't know, I still just thought it was a good idea. How much more difficult does that make his life and make it harder for him to fulfill what God has called him to do? He's got this weight or this burden that he's still hanging on to. It was the one thing that you went through in your life, but don't hold on to it. It comes to a place where you just need to lay that piece of timber down and say, hey, that got me to here, but I need to move on from here. Come on. We heard a word from Bonnie about bitterness. Stops you from fulfilling the vision of God. Powerful word. There comes a time where we need to put that thing aside and lay it down before the foot of the cross and go, God, I, just, I, I thank you that you've brought me through that. I'm coming out the other side, but I, I just don't want to carry that anymore. I'm just going to lay that down. I'm just going to put that plank down. I'm just going to keep on walking in the direction that you'd have me to walk. I know you'll get me there. Isaiah 43, 18 says, Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing, now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You know what? You can't move into the new thing until you leave the past behind. Hello? He said, first of all, you've got to forget the former things and don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. So what he's saying is, you're looking like this and you're seeing that piece of wood that got you to the shore and the brokenness that was there. You, you see it. It's always before you. It's always before you. But you've got to make a decision. I want to move into the new. And the only way I can move into the new is to take my eyes off that and to see the new thing that God wants to do in and through you. He'll use that experience. But unless you turn away from that, forget those things and don't dwell on it, see, I'm doing a new thing. We've got to turn and we've got to look and look to the future of what God has for us. Paul didn't stay there focusing on the shipwreck. He knew God had a call upon his life to get to Rome. 
that he was going to get an opportunity to speak to kings. That was the call upon his life. And if we continue to look back to those things and hold on to that brokenness, I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I'm not saying that it's something that you can just forget like that. But don't be carrying it with you. Get to a point where you say, I'm just going to lay that down before the feet of Jesus. And I'm going to turn now and I want to enter into the blessing that God has for me now. I want to enter into the purpose and the destiny that God has for me today. I don't want to dwell on that anymore. Come on. And that's for all of us. Paul said, I can consider those things as rubbish. The actual translation says as dung, he says. He said, I just see even the good things back then are rubbish compared to knowing Christ and everything that he has for me. Amen. Come on. He didn't want you to walk in bondage. He said, who the sun sets free is free. Indeed, he's come that you might have life and life to the full. He doesn't want you being pulled down by the bitterness of the past, by the brokenness of the past. He wants you to move forward into the destiny that he has for you. Put down the plank. Fourth thing. This is the final point. Don't sweat the small stuff. I'll say that again. Don't sweat the small stuff. When you've been through a trial in your life, when you've been through something that is so impacting in your life, there becomes these turning points in your life. God gave me a word this morning. It was this. God can turn a tragedy into a turning point. God can turn a tragedy into a turning point. Some of you know that you've been there. You've had a tragedy in your life. It's been the turning point for you. I was talking to a guy this morning. He said, I'd had cancer. And just at that stage, going through what I've had to go through, it was the turning point in his life. And when you've been through things like that in your life, it re- caused you to reprioritize your life. Who knows? A lot of people had a near death experience. I'm not saying you have to go through this, I'm just saying, this is an example. But had a near death experience or something happened where they nearly lost their life, and next minute they reprioritize everything in their life. Why? They just go, I just don't want to sweat the small stuff. My son went on a holiday. You know where he went on his holiday? It wasn't Hawaii, he went to Bosnia. That's a regular holiday destination, isn't it? But he travelled all around the world and he talked to some people and they said, go to Bosnia, it's a beautiful country and the people are great there. So he went to Bosnia, he was staying in the backpackers thing. He said, I don't think he's the guy running the backpackers, he's the sort of guy you want to be messing around with. I said, why? He said he had a rocket launcher in the hallway. I thought, well, that'll keep people in the line, I suppose. Bit of a reality check there, isn't it? And you know what he said? He said, they've been racked by war and they've lost so much. Now they just don't care about the little things that everybody worries about. Come on. Don't sweat the small things. Come on, we can get so tied up and we get our eyes off what God has called us to do and we get focused. If we get our eyes off what God's called us to do, we'll get focused on all the little things. All the first world problems. Oh, it's too hot. It's too cold. The chairs are put in a different way. The color of the chairs. Come on. Let's just get past that stuff. The style of music or something else. People get offended by it. Or you you run into a brother in the church and he'll say something to you. So you get offended and you walk away instead of going, he's just having a rough day. I mean, I, I don't get that. Christians can be so fickle where any little thing will just cause us to turn away and walk away from God. I remember when I was in the world, I had mates that would be going to a nightclub. They were serving the devil. They did it pretty well. So they go to the nightclub and the pub and next minute they'd say something and one of the bouncers would say something to them. They'd get a bit smart and the next minute that bouncer would grab them, throw them straight out the door. They're heading up the road, scun knees, everything like that and and then they go, oh, man, oh, I get really upset and want to fight him. But then they, they go home. Guess what happens next week? Does he go, that fellow hurt my feelings. I don't think I'm going back to that nightclub. He's there next week. He don't care. 
He don't sweat the small stuff. He's in there charging away, doing whatever he was doing before. He doesn't care. And yet when we become a Christian, those same people, we nearly become where we worry about all the little things. When there's a world out there that is dying, there was a Rome that needed to be impacted with the gospel. Paul just said, I can't be bothered with this stuff. He actually got off the ship. He got onto the island. And what happened? He was putting wood in the fire and a snake jumped out and bit him on the hand. And all the people said, he's going to swell up and die. The locals said that. So they knew it was a venomous snake that bit Paul. So they were waiting for him to swell up and die. You know what Paul did? Man, he'd just been through a shipwreck and God had saved him. He knew that God had a call upon his life. It says, you know what Paul did? He didn't even freak out. He just shook it off and kept on going on with what God had told him to do. Sometimes we've got to shake off those small things. Don't get tied up in them. They don't matter. Get focused on what God has called us to do. That is winning the lost, reaching out to those that are lost and broken out. Listen, listen, reaching out to those that in every sphere of life, they need Jesus Christ. And while we're worrying about all the little things and what he said and she said, there's people that are perishing. Paul just said, I can't be bothered with this. He just shook it off and he got on with what God was calling to do. He spent a couple of months there preaching the gospel to them till they could get another ship. And then they took him off and he went to Rome. It says this in Acts 28, 28. Therefore, I want you to know God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Now listen to this. This is when Paul got to Rome. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented home. Now he was supposed to be going there to go to court. But he was staying there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Isn't that amazing? God had got him to Rome and instead of being in prison, he's in his own house and he's out there preaching to everybody. And you know what? God is faithful to his word. The book of Philippians testifies to that. It finishes off with this scripture. It says in Philippians 4, 18 to 23, it's at the end of the book of Philippians. Paul speaking. I received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied. You know what he said? I I can live with much or I can live with nothing. He didn't sweat the small things after he'd been through everything he'd been through, Paul. He said, "I, I, I, I can live in any situation. I received the gift, Aphroditus, and the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. This is just the preamble. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He knew that. To God, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now listen to these final greetings. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints, these are the ones in Rome that he'd impacted since he was in Rome. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Hello? God was saying he was going to give him an impact with kings and leaders and rulers. Paul went to Rome and what did he do? He got a whole heap of people saved in Caesar's house. That was the top guy in the land, the most powerful man in the land. Paul had an opportunity to minister to the people in his home and there was believers in the house of Caesar. You know what? We have to go through sometimes to get to where God would have us to be. He'll use that brokenness. He'll use those situations you face. But he will get you to the destination. And not only will he get you to the destination, but he will fulfill your destiny. Amen? Come on. He impacted people. There were souls saved. You know what? We've got to get our eyes off the small things and get it on the task that God has set for each and every one of us. And that is God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on. He so loved the world. We don't need to be afraid of the world. 
but we need to have a love for the world. Don't doubt your deliverer. Allow God to use the driftwood. Put down the plank and don't sweat the small stuff.